Thank you everyone who's just logging in for this week's Mechie Alliance seminar. Um, as per usual, we'll wait um, just two to three minutes to make sure everyone can log in, grab their coffee and get settled. And we'll get started with our talk from Dr. Burnell. Uh, welcome to those who have just joined. This is the Mechie Alliance weekly seminar. We are waiting just a couple of moments for uh, everyone to be able to log in and we'll begin our presentations shortly. For those of you who are just logging in, we're going to wait one more minute and then I'll begin by introducing today's Mechie Alliance seminar speaker. Okay, 12.03 by my clock, so I say we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this week's Mechie Alliance seminar series. My name is Teresa Wirth. I'm the program manager of the Mechie Alliance, and I'm pleased to introduce to you today Ned Burnell. Um, Ned is a recent PhD recipient in the ideation lab working with Maria Yang and will be presenting to us today on a worker center approach to con convex optimization and engineering. Um, we will hold a Q&A at the end of the seminar, so please use the Q&A feature or the chat to submit your questions, and hopefully by then we will um, have been joined by our program director, um, Brian Anthony, who will help facilitate those questions. So, Without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Ed. I will stop sharing our open slide and you can share your screen and begin. Oh, welcome, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Dr. Brian Anthony, <laughs> program lead of the Mechie Alliance. <laughs> Ned, how are you? Good. Everyone Good. can you hear me? Yes. We hear you well. Um, Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Will do. Uh, I'm Ned. I just defended my PhD in the Mechie department a month ago, so this presentation is going to be unsurprisingly pretty based on that. Uh, a worker-centered approach to convex optimization and engineering design is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm really hoping by the end of this talk those words will make sense both individually and in combination. But before we get to the jargon, I really wanted to start with how I came to this work. Uh, after I got my undergrad degree, also at MIT Mechie actually, 
I worked at your Makani Power developing strange kite-like wind turbines like you see here. The work was just what I'd hoped for while studying engineering, making a more sustainable world via a crazy idea that required a huge amount of finesse to even get off the ground. The kites were basically electric airplanes that used their propellers to take off and to slow themselves down in midair. And the 25-foot wingspan prototype that three of us would carry across the testing site pulled on the ground station with the weight of two cars, while sending down 25 kilowatts at a few hundred volts. Getting it in the air required a huge amount of coordination between structures, electronics, aerodynamics, controls, and so on. Uh, when I first started, there were only 20 of us. So not messing this up mostly involved popping your head into the next door office to get your pot new idea shot down before you'd even given it a name, not that I'm upset. Or if your concept made it past that stage, at Design Review, you could always rely on the wonderful Tim Anderson, who kind of didn't really work there, but shared the machine shop to ask a simple structural question, which would immediately reveal that the emperor's clothes were hanging by, at best, a thread. It was wonderful. But during the year I was there, we got acquired by Google X, tripled in size, and suddenly the person who knew the subsystem I was interacting with might be a couple hours of Bay Area traffic away in our second office. Design reviews started only having employees, and worse, only people with highly overlapping expertises. These cartoons, which ran in a magazine actually produced in 18, 1943 by and for the offices of Lockheed's Vega subsidiary, illustrate the sort of dream airplanes that different design groups imagine. The structure group might want one made out of I-beams. The power plant group might want one that's more than half engine. The aerodynamics group wants one with neither structure nor engine nor passengers. Vegas offices had maybe less traffic to deal with in Burbank at that time than we did in the Bay Area, but through this cartoon, you can see they clearly felt some of the same pains of scale that we were feeling at McConaughey. The idea of design, of course, is for those various perspectives to come together through compromise, through the structures team grudgingly putting away the steel I-beams, through aerodynamicists admitting they need the wing to stay in one piece for the entire flight. At McConaughey, I got to experience the unsettling sensation of seeing this consensus fragment a bit or become foggier. The kind derailments I'd come to expect in design reviews now came a lot later. Late enough that I not only had a name for my idea, but a CAD model and a simulation. Now in its third design review, when the first power electronics engineer to even glance at my concept pointed out a glaring and fundamental flaw, I wanted to defend it. How could my careful work, this beautiful visualization, mean nothing? How could there be no overlap between our perspectives of what was possible and desirable? This wasn't, on the face of it, a technological problem. But technology was the hammer in my hand. And so when I talked to Woody Hoberg about the lab he was starting in MIT's AeroAstro department and about his hopes for geometric programming as a way to make engineering models faster and more modular, I dreamt of design tools that might address this fragmented consensus and soothe some of those pains of scale. And at MIT, I've been able to do some work towards that goal. Uh, this slide lists the particular contributions that I've been working on towards our understanding of engineering design tools, building on these sort of these three concepts from the literature, design spaces, convex optimization, and sociomateriality. Any of these terms you don't already know, I again hope you leave this presentation feeling comfortable with, and any you do know, I hope you leave with a slightly different perspective on. I'll be presenting on design spaces and convex optimization in order while touching on sociomateriality throughout. And then I'll conclude this presentation with some thoughts for future work. Mostly the results of this research have been demonstrated in and around GPKit, a Python-based domain-specific language for geometric programming, which I started work on with Woody's guidance just before entering graduate school. He and his lab used GPKit daily, while I, in Maria Yang's ideation lab, uh, developed with their feedback and code contributions. From the very start, GPKit's development relied heavily on the insights of these users. Even outside of their direct and patient requests for specific features, the knowledges that engineers have of their work, the way they talked about it, were always what inspired my research, often in the nascent form of novel syntax and algorithms. Inevitably, these would then work out in practice rather differently than I expected, showing what I had and had not grasped of their experience. See, for instance, this screenshot of GPKit's issues page. 914 issues open, closed rather, 14 open, including some issues that were obvious bugs, definitely my fault. Other issues that might be a bug, might be a misalignment between expectations and mathematics, 
generally a fascinating combination of the two. And then pie in the sky, what if discussions, fantasies of how people wanted to do their work. The depth and breadth of this feedback that I've gotten still astonishes me. And it is, it is in this sense that I call my research a worker-centered approach. For what stands out, I think, in GPKit is how it encodes a way of thinking derived from the culture and experience of engineering design work. In time, GPKit found users outside the lab. These organizations have been my field sites in this research, and most of them still use GPKit every week. They don't all use it in the exact same way. Some, particularly that transportation startup, which you'll hear more about, use GPKit as a way to centralize consensus, just as I dreamed of at Makani. These organizations have really been the experiments of this work. So first, we're gonna go through that outline, starting with design spaces, briefly defined as constrained sets of those designs considered both possible and potentially desirable. The term is actually over 60 years old, but its applicability to the daily practices of engineering has really grown kind of hand in hand with computation. Of course, any software that represents designs creates a design space, but intentionally taking them into account can greatly improve that software. Arguably, this is what parametric CAD did that really cemented its position in engineering work. While existing literature and software firmly established this concept, and there's been some excellent work to move beyond considering aspects of a design's form and construction as the only inputs and performance analyses only as the outputs of those. This work really asks, how does it affect engineering design work to take such input-output flexibility for granted, letting which variables are considered inputs and which outputs be a free and easy thing to change? It turns out that doing so as design spaces serve directly as composable and modular representations of engineering intent able to be assembled to an understandable complexity within a project and able to be shared across projects. Indeed, this freeing and fixing of variables is its own form of design space exploration, ubiquitous in engineering practice, but often neglected by academic literature, which sometimes searches for or assumes that each problem has a final correct partition between fixed or free variables. But before we get into the details of this, let's consider some actual design spaces. So here's some GPKit code. This is a conventional way to represent a design space in GPKit. This one was written by Michael Burton, subscribed in a paper of his on a solar airplane, and it represents an aspect of that airplane, the wing's aerodynamics, through two kinds of objects, variables, which hold the numbers considered to define a wing, and constraints, which describe the rules those numbers must follow if they are to be considered a valid wing arrow. Notice that some of these variables have values associated with them, like CL stall is 1.3, which serve as a kind of input to the code. This variable is fixed to this value. Most variables, however, are not fixed, and their value is unknown until the code is run. We'll be returning to this code in more depth later, but let's consider a simpler design space first, a bicycle. Bicycles can still be pretty complicated, actually, so let's just consider that central triangle, six variables, three lengths, three sides. It's all our uh, imagined manufacturer said they would need to make our crazy new bike a reality. And let's even actually just start with the angles. What are our options for those? What constrain those? Well, negative angles, or those over 180 degrees, would be confusing for our definition of a triangle. So let's constrain them between 0 and 180 degrees. Geometrically, these limitations can be thought of as making a cube of a design space that's 180 degrees on each side. Of course, there's another limitation for flat triangles. The angles have to sum to 180 degrees. Geometrically, this forms a plane that intersects with the previous cube to form a triangle between three of the cube's corners. Our 3D design space is now looking kind of 2D, and this sort of flattening occurs whenever there's an equality constraint that's used to define a design space. And again, triangles are pretty basic, but this helps illustrate the geometric way of thinking about these design spaces. So if we pull that 2D shape out, illustrate it a bit, we get this, a triangle that shows all possible triangle angles. We could use this as a design tool for selecting a triangle, I could mouse around a bit, stop moving my cursor, and let's say it ended up somewhere near the center, basically an equilateral triangle with 60 degrees all around. Well, we might end up with a bike that looked a little bit like this. It's a bit impractical. It does have a certain allure. We'd also need to define a perimeter length, of course, uh, to arrive at a particular size of bike. And with that dimension of perimeter, this is sort of the full design space of possible inputs to our, to to our tool. It's a three-dimensional space 
And it has actually a bijective map to our six dimensional triangle design space where every point in this volume maps uniquely to a valid triangle and vice versa. This is all possible triangles with a perimeter of below 200 centimeters. But this isn't the only way to represent that space of all possible triangles below that perimeter. There's another flattening. If we instead chose triangles by their side lengths, we'd get an input space like the one on the left, which the three sides instead of the three angles. And this is also bijective to that same sort of six dimensional three sides, three angles space. Since both design spaces have been sliced at a two meter perimeter, every triangle in the left red area is directly represented in the right red area and vice versa. But that doesn't mean that these are, just because these are equivalent in that way, doesn't mean they're fully equivalent, right? What if we try to design our triangles in that way, or try to design our bicycle with the side lengths instead of with the angles and the perimeter? Well, it would make it much easier to design both triangles in the bicycle, since what they share is a side, not an angle. Representing that shared side in angles and perimeters would be a bit awkward. So the choice of variables we make affects how easily subsystem design spaces can be composed into an overall system design space. And if we look back at this GPKit code, composition and interactions with other design spaces is one of the main things it's there to describe. All the highlighted lines of code do only that. For instance, this is defined as the design space of wing air dynamics, but it also takes variables from a flight state design space and the plan form design space contained by the wing. And it guarantees will lower bound how skinny that plan form is, the AR variable, short for aspect ratio, and prevent it from going to you know, a stub with zero aspect ratio, since doing so would be pretty disastrous aerodynamically. But it won't do anything to stop an infinite aspect ratio. You would need to compose this with another design space for your airplane not to do that. Probably one noting the mild structural disadvantages of an infinitely skinny wing. This hierarchy of design spaces is shown in this diagram, which is actually automatically generated from the same code that from this from the overall model code that we've been looking at a part of. This will show how engineers compose and reuse simpler subsystem design spaces to form an overall complex model. Ignore the thickness of the lines for now, but notice the labels. Here are the two instances of the wing air design space that we've been looking at and they're both contained in the two instances of the aircraft drag design spaces. Note that the reason that these all flow together is because design spaces are composed of the intersection of the branches to the right and their own constraints. So aircraft drag has other aspects, tail aerodynamics, and itself is only a part of the climb and flight segment design spaces, which are themselves only a part of the very top level mission design space. The design spaces are created pretty much from upper right to lower left in this. So mission is actually the last to be created. And all of these performance design spaces we've gone through are created after that aircraft design space, which contains the wing, which contains the plan form. And remember that plan form actually needed to be referenced for the creation of the wing arrow model. These are numbered plan form.2 because it's actually the third plan form, third instance of a plan form in the overall model. There's two others, one, plan form zero, plan form one, and these are in the horizontal and vertical tails, which are in the empennage, sort of the tail assembly of the plane. So all these design spaces, you can see a plan form wing arrow are reused within the project. And actually many of them are used across projects as well. And this is actually a bit, a bit unusual in computational modeling to have that kind of reusability modularity. But I think but by really trying to shape these design spaces with an eye towards composition, uh, GP could enabled that. And it really went through several, it required going through several ways of representing subsystem design spaces and a lot of ways of thinking about them before we came up with a system that seemed to work for most of the engineers we worked with. And there's a paper that has a bit more of a rundown on this as well as my dissertation. But let's think for a bit about how that whole idea brings design spaces into the design process. The problem that we originally outlined of figuring out what is a potentially interesting design, what's a potentially interesting airplane, is now done by composing the design spaces of potentially interesting wings, motors, fuselages, each of which is itself partly defined by composing the design spaces of valid flight states, plan forms, airfoils, in actually just the same way as we diagrammed here with these sort of dreams of various design groups. The compromise here, the consensus finding, is now fully intertwined with the code and the process of coding. In the transportation startup, which uses GPKit, the way this was done in code 
actually mapped directly onto internal communication gaps, just like I'd been hoping for at Makani while I was there. A systems engineer used GPKit to make a central model of their transport, centralized, consulting with each subsystems team to make sure they bought into the particular submodel in that overall hierarchy. But as it turns out, the miscommunication at this company wasn't between teams of subsystem design engineers, but really between them and their managers. The engineers were worried about the costs and risks of new technologies, but the managers were worried about the product's need for these new technologies in order to differentiate itself in the market. Each group thought the other one was a bit crazy and felt the project would be doomed if they went the other group's direction. While I certainly wouldn't give GPKit full credit for the resolution of this schism, by bringing these various subsystem design spaces into a common language, it did provide a mechanism for accord, in this case through the value of passenger time variable in particular. Engineers could fully lay out the costs of new technologies, and managers could justify those costs by considering the speed increases they allowed as something passengers would be willing to pay more for. The engineers and managers' implicit design spaces could thus be brought back into overlapping as explicit GP kit design spaces with both sides feeling heard. That design spaces, which can seem like such a mathematical abstraction, are useful for this kind of consensus building is a key insight of GPKit and a contribution to our understanding of how design spaces relate to design work. It's also an insight into how seeing technical and mathematical aspects of engineering as inextricable from the social and the organizational is essential for understanding the consequences of design tools. And we've got a little bit more to talk about with design spaces. Going back to the bicycle for a bit, even if we're only designing the first, the central triangle, this angle selector has its weak points, right? Like the three corners where one angle approaches 180, the other two zero degrees are a bit structurally suspect. What if based on that engineering intuition, we restricted our tool to only make triangles whose smallest angle is at least 30 degrees? That would look something like this, you know, moving those tips. Here's how this tool change to our tool would change our design space. Sort of trims that triangle, pretty straightforward. But look what happens to the side length design space. It shrinks, but it also kind of rotates. This transformation is a bit more complex. Honestly, if we'd been using a side length based design tool, we'd likely have started with a different modification to make it more structurally sound, like requiring each side to be a minimum length or something. This generalizes to engineering. The choice of input variables heavily influences how design concepts grow and how design decisions are made. Engineers are highly aware of this, and so they tend to establish their choice of variables with an eye towards particular analyses. GPKit does something a bit odd in this. It allows inputs to be used as outputs and vice versa very easily without having to rewrite the whole model. For instance, if we free CL stall by deleting that 1.3, we can add a constraint relating to CL or other airfoil properties, opening it up as a new dimension in our design space. Alternately, we could actually fix CL, forcing the wing to fly at a given lift coefficient, just by adding a number to that line in the variable declaration. This allows for more flexible exploration of design subspaces and possible improvements to such code. And it's another contribution of this work to our understanding of design spaces in design processes. But it actually caused once a bit of a moral panic at the transportation startup. Some subsystem engineers asked the systems engineer doing GPKit modeling to analyze the effect changing a certain part for a worse, cheaper version would have on vehicle speed. The resulting speeds proved better than they expected. The subsystem engineers asked why and were taken aback to learn that the design model had reconfigured the entire vehicle to accommodate this worse part. With some emotion, they replied, that's unfair. Adding, afterthought, because it's unscientific. They were offended by the essence of this idea, that parameters they thought of as necessarily fixed inputs were instead free outputs. The design models they were accustomed to and the way they thought through designs in their heads simulated a virtual reality in which each part was sort of formed, assembled, and then set in motion to see how it performed. GPKit models, on the contrary, can fix and free any combination of form and performance variables. But why aren't fixed and free variables swapped more often? It's useful for analysis to say, hey, I want this performance, right? But if you have a simulation that runs in one direction from bicycle triangle to bicycle performance, and you have a computer sample over some space 
to try and guess or filter designs to fit that criteria, you very easily run into this problem where each new dimension, each new free variable increases the number of samples you need exponentially. Even with just our triangle design space sampling degrees and perimeter, a grid 10 samples wide in each dimension would be a thousand points. And each new dimension will add another order of magnitude to that, right? This is often called the curse of dimensionality. We've already seen how many dimensions there were in that tiny piece of the wing arrow airplane model. So the overall model has actually thousands of free variables. It's not looking good for us in terms of the curse of dimensionality. How can we get out of here? How can we lift the curse? So this is where convex optimization is really essential. Geometric programs, the form of convexity GPKit uses, are more than 50 years old. And it's well established that the mathematics of convexity allow us to solve, and the algorithms, optimization problems extremely quickly, and generally with closer to polynomial than exponential scaling. But convex optimization sort of lifts that curse of dimensionality at a great cost, for it requires convex design spaces, which strongly limit our choice of constraints. In return, it offers us the scalability we wanted, models with tens of thousands of variables that take only seconds to run, to which adding new variables barely slow it. When there was a Fortran model with over 1,500 variables, that is a 1,500 dimensional design space, so hard to visualize. When it was converted to GPKit, it ran 77 times faster on the most complex optimization cases. And Martin York, Burke Ostrich, and I have a paper with more details on that. But despite this benefit, convex optimization is extremely rare in engineering. Even more so than with design spaces, existing literature assumes uh, in convex optimization that the set of constraints is pretty complete and pre-known. My research with GPKit has helped demonstrate, I think, that seeing the discovery and modification of constraints as a component of an iterative design process, rather than something you know up front, makes convex, convex optimization much more applicable to engineering design. Also, while the optimization literature makes constant use of the beautiful mathematical structure of convex optimization to reduce the time it takes to achieve the solution, in presenting the results of a program, they often present only half that solution. Convex programs often have an intrinsic duality, essential to many solving algorithms. And along with the primal solution of optimized results, also return a dual solution that corresponds to a model's sensitivity to each of its constraints. Uh, GPKit contains several novel methods for representing and visualizing that dual solution beyond the fixed variable sensitivities of previous work and field observations of its use show that this dual solution is often the most productive half in an engineering design context, where the primal solution is just looked at, looks fine. The dual solution is often what guides ongoing work. So as mentioned, the mathematical structure of convexity has fascinating effects besides just raw speed, but you're probably wondering about that price. A convex design space is simply defined, a design space where every point on a line between two valid designs is itself a valid design. This corresponds reasonably well to the funhouse mirror definition of convexity as sort of pointing outward. A downward pointing curve is convex if the design space lies above it, as in this diagram. Any line between two points in this blue region will stay entirely within this blue region. But if the design space was below that curve, the space is not convex. There will be no fast optimization today. So how do we make sure that our design space stays convex? The conventional manner, which offers many advantages, is to construct it only from constraints and sort of functional building blocks whose convexity is guaranteed algebraically or can be determined by parsing all of the different operations. Classes of convex optimization problems are often named for these kinds of constraints that they accept. Geometric programming, which is what GPKit does, uses polynomial inequalities. Algebraically, they're specified by sums of products of variables, to arbitrary constant powers. So these are all polynomials here. And these are all polynomial inequalities. The only additional restriction is that the variables must always be positive. Or for signomial programming, which GPKit also supports, they must be of specified sign. You have, to know, you have to know whether they're positive or negative in advance. This is because polynomial inequalities aren't actually convex in themselves. As you can see here, uh, y greater than the square root of x is actually non-convex if we plot it conventionally. But polynomials are convex under a transformation which corresponds to that of a log-log plot. The squared function becomes convex, becomes a straight line under that log-log transformation. You can't take the log of a negative number, so no negative variables in a geometric program is the simplest way to put it. 
Uh, Stephen Diamond, who actually looks like is here, has a lot more to say about log log convexity and ways of constructing rules for that. But this is this is enough for now. Checking in with the GP kit code, and uh, yep, these constraints they're all positive inequalities. Or there's actually a couple. These are all positive inequalities here, CL and CD. Or there's a single term positive inequality specifying the Reynolds number RE there. And then sort of the X-foil fit there is the airfoil performance design space, which is defined by several posinomial inequalities. But how do you start choosing variables and constraints to even represent a design space real early when the plane is still just a collection of dreams like this separated? Well, you don't do it all at once and then be done with it. This is a standard model of product design process from planning to manufacture. GPKit is aimed squarely at the conceptual design phase here when not much is known about what a design should be, though there may be consensus on what to call it or what it should do. Designs at this stage are ideas, they're concepts, right? Little has been built yet, costly decisions have not been made, anything could change. On the other hand, not much is known about the design space, about what difficulties or opportunities might lie within it. The goal of a conceptual design tool is to cheat this chart a little bit. <clears throat> to try and get that knowledge as early as possible while there's still that freedom to change the design. So let's zoom into the concept development phase. How is a concept developed and how does convex modeling fit into that? I consider the use of convex optimization models in concept development this way, as an iterative process in itself, a cycle of gaining knowledge by trying different design spaces. A modeler has a concept, uses GPKit to formulate that concept as variables and constraints, and then GPKit translates that into a convex program. GPKit then parses the solver's solution and presents it to the modeler so as to best enable them to decide what to do next. If the model violates their expectations, they may need to repair their concept or their expression of it. If it doesn't, they will probably want to refine it, adding complexity to explore more detailed design spaces. This kind of remodeling is what GPKit is designed for. The purpose of any given GPKit model is to be imperfect so that you can use it to learn more. There's not really a point at which you sit back and just let it hand you the perfect design, even though that's often what people consider to be the purpose of optimization. If you've heard of convex optimization before, it was probably near the term global optimality. Global optimality means we can take a convex design space, choose a variable in that space as our cost function, and if the solver returns the design, it's guaranteed to return one that has the lowest possible value for that variable in its design space. The notion of optimizing a design's total cost to find the single best design is quite pleasing, but I've found that early stage design tools are really much more about exploration than optimization in that, in that sense. I try to do that, like GPKit in this work thus tries to use global optimality to increase the variety of questions engineers can ask of their models. Among other things, by encouraging the use of multiple different cost functions with the same set of constraints. Seeing convex models as iterations and explorations in a larger design process like this, thus presents us with some fundamentally new ways to use the mathematical structure of convexity. And nowhere is this clearer than with dual solutions. Most types of convex constraint have a mathematical duality, right? Which means that along with those free variable values, the primal solution solver turns that dual solution which quantifies the effect making each constraint easier by some epsilon would have on the, final, uh, on the optimal cost. Relaxing a constraint in this way can't make this solution worse because it only increases the size of the design space. You know, epsilon is greater than zero here. It can't remove the previous optimum, but it might make the solution better. That little new piece of design space might have a little lower cost. For each individual constraint, this partial derivative of just how much a slightly easier constraint would reduce the entire model's optimal cost is called that constraint's shadow price. This interpretation of the dual solution has been known since the advent of convex optimization for several reasons, including unitlessness. In geometric programming, we generally consider the log partial derivative instead, often called a sensitivity. These sensitivities can be calculated for fixed variables as shown by Woody Hoberg in his PhD thesis and they can also be calculated for sets of constraints. A whole design space can be expanded at once in this way. Thus, a design space can also have a sensitivity calculated from the dual solution. And now we can finally explain the thickness of the lines in this graph. This is showing the whole dual solution at once. The thickness of each line shows its sensitivity to each subsystem design space. Thicker lines mean a higher sensitivity, 
gray lines and thin ones show design spaces with near zero sensitivities, whose expansion only negligibly affects the optimal cost. They combine together as they flow left because expanding a design space is the same as expanding all its constraints and sub-design spaces at once. Presenting sensitivities to engineers like this is probably the single most useful feature of GPKit because sensitivities help you with every aspect of an iterative modeling process. If your model is broken, sensitivities help you repair it. If it's not, sensitivities help you refine it. They do so by showing just where a model needs attention. For instance, you may have already noticed the thickest branch here, the most sensitive subsystem without any subsystems of its own. This is the actuator prop design space. When this graph was made, actuator prop was also the newest code on this solar airplane project. Fresh constraints intended to replace the fixed variable eta prop, which modeled propeller efficiency as an immutable 85%. Adaprop had been one of the most sensitive fixed variables in this design space, a fact with engineer, which the engineers in the project became aware of when they actually saw its prominent entry in a default GPKit results table. This high sensitivity to their assumption seemed risky. If they were a little wrong about the sufficiency, it would sink the whole design's optimality. So they thought maybe they could reduce this risk by replacing the simplistic Adaprop with a more dynamic representation of a propeller design space. For weeks, they coded the actuator prop model, the whole design space of that, to replace this single variable. But actually, to their chagrin, once actuator prop had been fully integrated, it was only slightly less sensitive than that single variable had been, eta prop, and it stood out still like a sore thumb amidst more than a thousand other constraints. What was to be done? They were faced with three main options. Go back to eta prop, which was a risk with fewer moving parts keep actuator prop as it was, deciding that a little less sensitive was still a little better, or continue working on actuator prop, trying to find a different compromise between complexity and sensitivity. This was a fundamental conversation about how to organize and focus their work, prompted by and happening through GPKit's presentations of the dual solution. And it's worth noting that they followed that process of replacing a fixed variable with a new model because that works in the vast majority of cases. Many GPKit models start mostly as fixed variables, and they gain complexity only in sensitive areas as modelers start adding detail. Additionally, some GPKit models have successfully reduced complexity without increasing sensitivity just by removing those completely insensitive models, the thin gray lines from before. And reducing complexity during a modeling process is actually fairly uncommon. But as with actuator prop, it's the cases where this process of following sensitivities doesn't work immediately that really illustrate how it works in general. I once interviewed a GPKit user fr very frustrated that the jet engine component of their model was too brittle. Uh, the airplane is being designed around the engine. Quote, changing the airplane model doesn't change the optimal engine at all. Changing the optimal engine model completely changes the airplane. It's like an engine with a stick attached, end quote. Or perhaps like this dream of the engine design group that we saw earlier. There are two engineers using GPKit in this project, one modeling the engine, one modeling everything else. The everything else modeler had become personally convinced of this model's, of the engine's brittleness, but they weren't sure how to demonstrate it or convince their colleague actually making that model. At the time, I was actually still developing those sensitivity flow diagrams, so I made one out of curiosity. And voila, this was a vindication. Here they saw labeled confirmation of the model's sensitivity to the engine measured by the height of the red rectangles, to the exclusion of the rest of the airplane. More than half of the sensitivities of this model turned out to be just from that engine design space, similar to how that dream airplane was more than half engine. And I think that tells us what that dream airplane drawn at Vega three quarters of a century ago is really about. It's showing just where that design group's attention lies, what they're focused on and sensitive to. It's visualizing, in effect, the dual solution before convex optimization was even invented. That is, convex optimization presents a clear mirror to engineer's cognition, both in that cartoon and in how the sensitivity flow diagram reflected the insubstantial, an insubstantial sensation or intuition of that everything else modeler. Far from being abnormal to convex optimization or to design tools, this way of looking at technologies like GPKit is an established perspective in the social sciences. There's a variety of practices and references to make here. Too many for this talk. More details are in the dissertation. But the particular concept I found most useful and think my contributions fit best into is sociomateriality. 
which takes the perspective that the individual organizational material realities of a technology co-define each other. If you pull any one of them out, your analysis is going to miss something important. My contributions here have come in the form of trying to put this perspective into practice during the development of a new technology. Throughout this work, I've considered the personal practices and organizational processes of engineers as being just as real as the mathematics of convex optimization. Each presents just a different, but not prioritized or objective, perspective on engineering design. GPKit would not have succeeded as it has without this intertwining nor could I have described my research contributions, really, without these vignettes that I've been telling about these tiny knots of math and people. So we're low on time. This is a defense talk, so it's a little too long. But this is where we've been, talking about design spaces, convex optimization, sociomateriality. And I hope those sort of terms make sense more. Uh, skip the future work stuff. Yeah, but it's really, I think, for me, the organizations this is used in that have been the most important, and the ways in which design tools have shaped what engineering organizations continue consider possible. And that has a lot of strength to it. Realizing that and not shying away from the organizational aspects has, I think, been a great part of the success of GPK. That's the end of the presentation. Some quick acknowledgments to the Convex Engineering Group, uh, Woody, Cody, Philippe, Ali, Burke, Michael, Martin, and Arthur, the Ideation Lab, Maria, Jesse, Bo, Chifong, Eunice, and Priya, my committee, Caitlin Mueller, Warren Steering, Mark Drella, my family and friends, without any of these people, this work really wouldn't have come together in the way it has. It kind of takes a village. And um, finally, let's collaborate. I'm postdoc in the Ideation Lab right now. Let's do research. There's also some consulting happening around GPKit. So get in touch on either side of that. That's all for me. Ned, thank you very much. I sent you the, the virtual and the, the physical uh, clapping here. Uh, and, and sorry to not have be uh, on time to be able to, to introduce you at the very beginning. So thank you to Teresa for that. Um, I wanted to kick it off um, sort of asking, please ask questions, everybody, um, via the chat or raise your hand. But let me ask a, a, a question, uh, um, maybe a barrier, or what your thoughts on a barrier. So a lot of engineers design, at least on the, in the mechanical side, with sketches and drawings. You know, are there opportunities or what are your thoughts on how to get from sort of that design methodology to sort of the code that you need? How do you, how do you make those connections? Uh, you're on. You're on. You're on mute, Ned. Sorry. Now you can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways in which people are used to using sketches, uh, physical tests, and prototypes, and other things as ways to design. Those are all great. I think what GPKit is really trying to present itself as an alternative to is the detailed simulations that are often used. Uh, because those detailed simulations, when they're brought into the very early stages, have sometimes a negative externalities where they end up with people having discussions where they're arguing about modeling details that maybe only one person really understands. They're, they're very detail-oriented, right? They're trying to represent reality. And that can, I think, prevent people from actually having a good conversation when they start quantifying their design process. There's definitely a related question of how do you introduce quantification into a design process that, that, that isn't particularly already. Uh, I've got some thoughts on that in terms of using interval programming, working with more like GUIs and spreadsheet interfaces. But in general, if people are comfortable not quantifying these things. I don't see a need to pressure them. It's the situations where people are quantifying things without thinking about the organizational consequences. Very good, thank you. Uh, so we have some questions in the Q&A. Um, given the challenges of configuring a real engineering problem as a convex problem, would some type of meta heuristics, genetic algorithms, or other optimization approaches still allow the generation of the sensitivity maps? Uh, on a formal mathematical level, to some extent, with less guarantees, uh, you get very nice, but it's very nice having duality, both for speed reasons and for a lot of just guarantees and certificates you create. On a social organizational level, um, the difficulty of representing an engineering question in a convex way is very related to the difficulties of trying to explain your ideas in a clear and transportable way. Uh, and I actually think that convexity is a benefit for communication, even as like some problems definitely don't fit into it. Uh, it's very, if, if you have to have a car that's gonna drive either left or right, controls problems like that are almost impossible to re represent in a geometric program in particular, uh, and you shouldn't really try. Uh, but knowing that, knowing what is sort of the convex core of your design that you can represent this way, can have all this clarity on, 
and then agreeing from that sort of central consensus how to extend out into more detailed or um, less globally guaranteed models like genetic algorithms is something I think should be, you can do it as a group once you have that core consensus more easily. Very good, thank you. It, it uh, is hard work, but it's worth it, I guess. <laughs> we, we just have to teach everybody to communicate convexly, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, it, take, if you take like existing scripts or spreadsheets that people often use, a lot of times they are, like a spreadsheet tends to be just a bunch of things are being multiplied together. You've got some cells that often can be a seed for a convex model. Like convexity often arises from rules of thumb. Most rules of thumb tend to be that way. Non-dimensional quantities are always GP compatible. Very good. So I'll give you one more question and we'll close for the day. For yeah. uh, what are your thoughts? This is from Kevin. What are your thoughts on extending the toolkit to multi-objective optimization? In particular, how might the change GP kit design process in conversations around the design process? Uh, my experience is that all op optimization is multi-objective. If you look at it from the level of the design process again, like people are always balancing multiple things and you never really end up with like one cost function to rule them all where you're like, oh, we're totally sure that we totally trust this number, right? And so you're always bouncing off various um, things. The, the best use I've seen with GPKit is a design process where there were four uh, cost functions that were carried through. Uh, most of the modeling process where every time the model is changed, you'd say, okay, what's our flight, what's our like flight weight um, paragon, they would call it, or what's our like minimum takeoff weight plane paragon or minimum fuel cost paragon, right? And those gave people a way to understand the realm of options they were exploring. Uh, I think, so I think that's already a part of most design process conversations is that there's an existing practice of multi-objective discussion. And with GPKit, really the trick has been trying to fit into that in a way where people um, feel more enabled to say things that they're thinking, that they're maybe already thinking and sharing that with their colleagues. Very, very good, thank you. So I will do one more question. I think it's a very important one, certainly relative to this last week's seminar um, on manufacturing. Uh, what challenges are there in enabling quantitative conceptual manufacturability analysis in the design solutions? Uh, Manufacturability is really tricky for a whole lot of reasons. Um, part of that is just that, that, again, the organizational level is more complicated because unless you have firmly established way in advance with your entire supply chain exactly what's going to be expected at every stage, it's going to be hard to know what manufacturability, me manufacturability means for your partners and the rest of the links in the supply chain, right? And that's prone to change at a faster scale than other aspects of your design are, so it may not be worth fixing that super early. Uh, that's, I think, yeah, so I, th I think that the, there's also the difficulty of modeling manufacturability um, in general, where it tends to be really interesting mathematically. Uh, Caitlin Mueller, who was on my committee, has done some really good work on this. Uh, but I think that the, the biggest problem is just that it's very hard to have a kind of good consensus on manufacturability early on. And where you do have that, and where you can put that in as a good constraint, you absolutely should but most times that I've encountered it, uh, it ends up being really basic. Like, let's not make something bigger than this. Uh, and that's sort of the level which manufacturability is done. Oh, I should mention, um, Scott Nils actually did a PhD using GPKit, specifically looking at manufacturability of the Boeing Dreamliner in their uh, plant in, in, I think it's North Carolina. Uh, and we tried, we, there's some work, I think, uh, in his PhD thesis, also from MIT Mechie, on trying to apply that in early design, but that's a specific situation where one product is being made for so long that like the redesign and the manufacturing are happen like really at the same time. And there's very, it's a very controlled process. But in that situation, you can try to do some sort of manufacturability things down to like the level of individual line stations in your assembly line. Very good, Ned, thank you very much. Uh, great talk, great work. And I look forward to you know, hearing all the great things that you do in the future. So, so thank you. Thank um, you. So attendees, thank you very much. Um, and just wanted to uh, make sure you, we advertise uh, next week, same time, same channel, um, the next Mechie Alliance seminar speaker, uh, Dr. Solana Borosina, uh, will be talking about meeting and preventing new challenges in biochemical sensing. Uh, so please join us then. Um, and also, if you would like to hear from other speakers, uh, yourself, um, do let us know. Reach out, send us, a, drop us a line. People at MIT, people not at MIT, um, we invite you to join us, invite you to present. So do let us know. Uh, and with that, everybody have a great day.
uh, stay safe. And thank you. And Ned, again, thank you very much. Thank you.